The Six Nations, in my opinion, is the greatest annual rugby tournament in the world, with six teams competing to win the coveted trophy at the end of the season. Of recent times, the question of promotion and relegation has been asked quite a lot, and I thought it would be interesting to get the perspective of those from Italy, Georgia and other nations involved in the debate on what they think should happen, taking a deep dive on how their current teams are doing and looking at what they would like to see happen with the Six Nations. There'll be links to everything that those guys do down in the description down below. Do go and check them out. And if you go on to enjoy this video, I'd massively appreciate it. If you could like the video, subscribe to the channel, it's free to do. Loads of content with the Six Nations, of course. And let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on what should happen. First of all, let's chat about the Italians. Then, I'll tell you, I wanted to get your thoughts on Italian rugby in general, but first, looking back at the six nations you've been in the six nations now for 22 years um, yeah exactly and it's a weird one because i felt when italy started in the six nations from 2000 maybe to 2013 you could see moments you could see bits where italy were really competitive were getting some big wins against wales sadly again, wins <laughs> against wales wins yeah, against scotland against Ireland, against <laughs> France as well so some really good wins um how do you reflect on the past 22 years? I know it's a long time to reflect on, but how do you look back on the 22 years that Italy have been involved? Well, this is actually a nice assist because we wrote also another piece. It's in Italian though, but you can easily translate it with Google um, earlier than the one that went around the whole rugby Twitter. We wrote another piece which analyze, analyzes how Italy has moved on from, progressively of course, from the um, massive is it is it called equiparation in English too? This this practice of uh, bringing players from other schools and other nations in your movement, progressively moving towards having players of our own built in the country and so on. And the numbers are clear; it's going down. So uh, we have more and more players that are formed in Italy, and less and less players that are Im imported. I don't like this word, but just to be clear on what I mean. This doesn't mean that it's a wrong thing, but it means that we have a movement that is starting producing something over the years. And if you look at the first 10 years of Six Nations, in fact, most of the players, there's one year, I think it's 2014 or 15, we have half of the team, which is not Italian. So it's that was the peak. And from then it went down. So what I'm reflecting here, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I think we try to kickstart our presence in the tournament with talent from abroad. But at some point, when the first generation change happened, yeah, we had to start relying on our uh, on our arms only. Then maybe Danilo has a different opinion, though. I don't know. No, 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 no. No, uh, uh, no I'm, I, I totally agree with, with you, Matteo. And there is another thing so that uh, in the first years, uh, the main uh, uh, block of players, they were playing abroad. Uh, so if we think about players like Bortolami, who now is the head coach of Benetton, or uh, Bergamasco brothers, uh, or um, Castro Giovanni, uh, just to name Paris, uh, Paris uh, just to name a few of them, that they were the, the, the most important players in that team. They were all playing abroad. Now the system is changing and uh, the player that they grown in the Italian system, then uh, mainly they play in uh, Benetton and Zebra. Uh, so I think that uh, that fact changed a little bit the equi equilibrium. No? And, and now some players started to go again abroad. Uh, but when they played to go abroad, we need players that they play in those teams so like garbizi now in montpellier uh, and then maybe i don't know the day that uh, we will have again a good numbers of player playing abroad plus a fair numbers of player italian player playing in at a good level in the urc or uh, what it will be so then maybe italy, italy can can come back to be competitive again, let's hope. And obviously the man in charge at the minute is Kevin Crowley, very successful at Benetton. Uh, Danilo, what do you make of him as the head coach? Do you think that's the right guy after Franco Smith? I, I don't know if he, is, if, he, if he is the right guy. Definitely is the guy that is now on the, uh, let's say, leading the team. And I think that uh, uh, we have to trust him. Uh, you mentioned that he was very successful at Benetton. At one point, yes, 
Let's not forget that the last season of Kieran Crowley at Benetton came out with a Rainbow Cup uh, trophy, but with zero win in the URC, zero. So, uh, so I think that it was the best option maybe at the moment, uh, just to, to give some continuity with the work that it was done uh, in, in the franchise. But it was a little bit strange, you know, because at, at first uh, um, it was meant after Roshi, it was meant to have, by the way, a Welsh coach uh, who he was involved in the betting the scandal and so on. Now I can even not remember the name of that guy. So sorry, my bad. But then uh, they decided to take Franco Smith just from, from a transition period. Then the transition period went longer uh, for a season more. Then there was a new president coming in in the Italian Federation. And then came the idea of, of Kieran Crowley to give full trust to Kieran Crowley, who worked before with Canada. So he had already international experience. And what is trying to do Kieran Crowley with the national team? It is to, to bring, he says every time, uh, to bring trust and and to be respected in the international scene, uh, but it's a step by step work. I don't he think said, that we vacation are. Vacation is over, boys. <laughs> First day. Vacation is over. Yeah, yeah, I think that we cannot uh, uh, ask for respectability. We have we Italy national team has to earn. So uh, respectability is not something that you can like buy. So you have to earn with with, with the fact, with the, with the performance in the pitch. So I think that he's the guy that we have now, and we have to trust him. Yeah. One of the shining lights in Italian rugby this year has been the success of Benetton winning the Rainbow Cup, of course, and getting some big wins against the likes of Edinburgh this season. They currently sit eighth in the table. As, of course, Daniello and Matteo were huge Benetton fans. I wanted to get their thoughts on the success of the team and why it wasn't really working for Zebra and how important Benetton could be to the success of Italy. This is what they had to say. Well, this is a more difficult question, to be honest. Um... Marco Bortolami is a new head coach, so we couldn't really expect much out of him on the first year. This is exceeding our expectations, in fact. Uh, he was the assistant coach to Kieran Crowley, so for sure he is already a man of the environment uh, before. It's not like he came in um, in the recent months. However, he brought a different mentality. A few things have changed, and the game is, I would say, a bit more practical and structured and to some degree this is helping us getting those points in what danilo was was saying before about kieran crowley uh, about the offensive abilities in fact our team with him was the one with the highest amount of offloads i think of the whole league but definitely one of the highest uh, numbers of offloads you could see on any game because it was somewhat risky but paying off to some degree not the last year and with bortolami we are not resourcing as much to this particular uh, game, uh, can I say tactic? I don't know, or to this particular um, skill. We are going more for progressively gaining ground, using the kick, and it's a more structured game. The, co the commentators were saying that at the last time they played, uh, they were commenting on the fact that we were doing sessions and sessions of two rucks and one kick, two rucks and one kick, and they were showing it like look they're gonna do it again in fact one two and a kick so i think he brought a more structured mentality a more practical approach maybe simpler it won't pay off every time but it's giving us that middle of the board placement so far Danilo, what is going on at zebra i mean they got rid of michael bradley didn't they halfway through the season haven't won a game yet in the urc i don't think so and haven't won in europe what is going on at Zebra and why is Zebra struggling and Benetton doing so well? There are some cultural uh, uh, reasons that Matteo explained very good uh, in the article that he wrote. Uh, um, and, and I think we can start with that. Uh, Treviso, it, was, it, it, it is and it was a club. So Treviso, had, before it was in the Italian Championship, won a lot of, of titles. So by the way, uh, still have his... Uh, youth uh, category and kids and so on and so on so treviso is a club is well grounded in the city in the territory 
and so uh, there are two different uh, two different system by the way zebra is totally uh, supported by federation uh, Treviso is the half a half as you as you spoke to before about uh, cardiff and so on uh, so there are two different system and maybe for maybe for italian uh, structure mentally structure and so on uh, it is better to have some private uh, interest and some uh, club culture to to go on by the way in Italy now, there is a lot of uh, rumors and talks that it can change something. Uh, Martin Ocenti, the president of Italian Federation, uh, told that he's not happy about how Zebra is going. And there are a lot of rumors to have a new franchise in the same Treviso style uh, in Padua. But uh, a couple of days ago, went out a new uh, development project, which mentioned that uh, one of the academy will be uh, italy had four academy so two will stay and two will be linked to to the franchises one to treviso the other one to the zebra so maybe that's a sign that it will not change when talking about promotion and relegation one of the teams that is always mentioned is georgia having won the second tier competition in europe every single time bar one in the past decade it certainly raises a question as to whether they are ready for the six nations i chatted with georgian rugby fan luca to get his thoughts on the situation talking about the growth of rugby in georgia how important it is for them to face uh, teams of tier one at level in georgia and whether having a team in the urc would benefit the side have a listen to this um first of all luca could you tell me a little bit about georgian rugby at the minute of course one uh, the, since 2011, all of the Rugby Europe International Championships, except for the one in 2016, which Romania won. Yeah. So very, very successful time for Georgia. Um, where do you feel like Georgia are at at the minute? Of course, got that draw against Portugal last week, not the greatest result. But where would you say Georgia are at at the minute in terms of as a team? So obviously, um, we are dominating Rugby Europe Championship for now. Uh, we have won, as you said, a lot of most of our com most of the competitions in the past. So, and I think honestly, we will win this one as well. But I'm very glad that there is a huge uh, competition on this one, and it's not that easy to win. And as you said, Portugal showed some great games, and they have great, amazing backs, and they can run the ball. They have a pace, so it's really interesting to have a lot of competition on this tournament because in some years we have won it pretty easily especially in like 2015-16, after the World Cup, we had a great team. Uh, some other years, it was not that easy. Right now, um, we're struggling a bit. Um, we have some new players. Uh, we have Georgian coach. Um, we're still dominant, uh, I, I would say. And I think we will win the tournament again. But I'm very glad to see Romania is coming back and they're strong. Uh, they haven't been this strong for, for some time. Um, Portugal is showing they can actually win the tournament and they are really trying to qualify for the for the World Cup. And uh, Spain is actually, I think, they're underachieving. Um, they have a good team. They can actually do a lot of, a lot better than they're doing. But they're also in the competition, so they can win it as well. So we'll see. Uh, I'm not that confident we will win, but I still think we, we have it. And we're not at the best... Um, state right now but uh we are re rearranging some things and uh seeing some new players and we are implementing some new tactics um but you know the goal is rugby world cup and not um uh, rack or winning another rack so i'm pretty confident to be honest looking to see the games between georgia and italy just out of interest there's only been two games i couldn't believe yeah. that there'd only been two games italy won both of them but they've both been in italy do you think the Georgian rugby fans want to see that game more often? Do you think that game would give us a better understanding of where Georgia are at in comparison with Italy? Yeah, I mean, Georgian fans really, really want that game. Um, we, we, Every fan you ask, they're all looking for the Italy-Georgia game. And that game uh, we, we lost in Florence was actually quite close. Um, we started strong, but then Italy, Italy went away 
Um, they were winning pretty comfortably, but at the end of the game, we came in. You know that Italy has like a last 20 minute complex, and they had the same against us. So actually, there was like a one point where one of our second rowers had a break and he did this offload, and our number nine was going to catch it, but he dropped it. Otherwise, he had a clear line and it was going to be like a one score game afterwards. So um, Italy won the game comfortably. They won, it. Uh, they deserved to win, to be honest. But it was not, um, how to say, a team from whole complete level. They were a team that we can beat under right circumstances, you know. Um, so actually, um, I think there might be a Georgia-Italy game in Georgia in summer. There are some rumors about it. Yeah, and that will be a hell of a game uh, if it actually happens. But um, to be honest, I love Italian team. The only reason why I don't support them as much because... There's like all these arguments about us joining Six Nations against them or in their expense or so, something. But I think they have fantastic players. I, I love their number 10. I love the Caprici. I love Negri, Poledri. They have amazing players. It's sometimes it's really good to watch them, honestly. Uh, but they're not consistent. They have been underperforming in Six Nations. They haven't won game for seven years. And they have hell of a cabinet of, made out of wooden spoons. So um, it's really hard to argue... Uh, of not having against of not having a way for other nations to join Six Nations in a way or not. So as you know, all the competitions below Six Nations that are held in Europe actually have a promotion relegation system. So if you uh, prove yourself to be the best team in a competition, you have a chance to go up. So I think it should be the same with the Six Nations. I think what was really interesting to me, I'm a big fan of the Ospreys in Wales who play, of course, in the URC. I know there's a lot of Georgian players who play in France. But when the announcement came out that the South African teams were going to join the URC, what do you think the feeling was in Georgia? Do you think there was a feeling that we could have had a team in the URC? Do you think that would be something that Georgian fans would like to see? Do you think that would be the next step? I actually, I actually hope we do. So if you ask me, uh, for Georgian rugby, it will actually be better to join URC rather than Six Nations. I mean, Six Nations is a hell of a money, so money is always good. But uh, you only have five top games um, in a year, uh, while at URC you have 20, maybe even more games in a year. So for Georgian rugby level to rise, joining URC would be amazing. Um, I, I don't like that URC changes their names and their structure every year now. So it's, it's kind of hard to follow it sometimes. Um, and Irish teams are dominating over there. So uh, I do watch it quite a bit, actually. But um, And I hope we join it. Um, and actually, the Rugby Europe just started like a Rugby Europe Super League. I don't know how it's Super Cup. It's, it's called something like that. And there are teams from Russia, Romania, Netherlands, um, Spain, Portugal, Belgium and uh, from Israel, actually. So, uh, actually, I would love to see more of European teams joining that competition. So, for instance, <clears throat> maybe someone from Poland, they have a pretty okay level of rugby, the same as Netherlands. Uh, maybe someone from Germany. Uh, and because all of these markets I mentioned, like Germany, Portugal, Netherlands, um, it's a huge markets they all have money spain portugal they all have money they are all good in sports if you look at like football basketball they all play um and they can produce pretty decent teams in like 10 15 years time so um i would like to see them joining like not joining it right now but have an opportunity to play urc and um, uh, six nations if they prove it that they're the next best team you know like you, you need to give them opportunities, just fair. There is, um, it, it's a bit better. Like we had Scotland visiting and I love Scottish rugby for that because they were the first year one team who actually visited. Um, and let me tell you, Scottish fans had a blast. Um, they, they had the, one of their best times in their lives. Um, and Georgia is right now, because we have proven that we can play against them, is a bit more blessed, but... Romania, not so much. Portugal, not so much. They just got a game against Japan. Uh, Uruguay, not so much. There are a lot of other teams who have shown glimpses of um, 
success and um, <clears throat> what, at what level they can potentially play, but they don't get uh, chances that much, to be honest. And going to Georgia, playing in Tbilisi, first team like tier one nation to do that. Do you think that needs to happen more? That that then would teams would go there, play and be like, okay, great place to play rugby. Fans would go have a great time, as you say. Do you think that is the way for these tier one nations to realise that actually Georgia one can host big games and can put on a good event? Two, they are competitive against these teams and the product as a trip away. So, you know, one of the things of the Six Nations going to Rome, it's a great weekend, yeah. great food, great atmosphere, historical city, that Georgia can do that. And do you think then that would then maybe open the conversation more towards the Six Nations? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there should be more um, T1 games away to Georgia, to Spain, to Romania, to the uh, Uruguay, to Brazil. Um, because all the countries I mentioned, they're actually amazing to visit. I have been to Rome. I love Rome. And I've heard so many times from uh, Six Nation fans that, uh, or, or actually um, pundits, uh, that trip to Rome was amazing. And I completely agree, it is. But trip to Madrid is no less. Uh, trip to Porto is no less. It's amazing cities. Uh, I was in Amsterdam right now. It, I had a great time. Um, and Phyllis, let me tell you, it's, it's great. I, I, I saw Scottish fans. They had life of their time, uh, time of their lives. And um, I have seen a lot of Irish and Welsh fans uh, for their football trips away. They had great time. So it's uh, Georgia, for instance, is um, quite cheap. It's um, great food, great culture, great wine, uh, cheap beer, um, fans that love rugby, fans that are happy to meet you and treat you with their beer, talk about rugby all day long. Um, um, great culture, as I said, you can see some places, uh, enjoy. That's that's all you need for a rugby weekend. You don't need anything else. So and Spain, I was in Madrid for a game. It was amazing. It's not only Georgia that we have to talk about when talking about promotion and relegation in the Six Nations. Although the development of nations such as Spain and Portugal are a few years behind Georgia, they certainly are an emerging nation at Tier 2 level and are playing some exciting rugby along the way. I spoke with the guys from the Overlap podcast to get their thoughts on Spain and Portugal and what can we expect for their pathways over the next few years. Let's hear what they've got to say. Have a chat about some of the other nations. Uh, we just mentioned them there. Portugal getting a really good draw against, uh, not Romania, Georgia last week, beating Canada last year. Talk to me about Portugal. How good are they? Because they play really exciting rugby, don't oh, they? So Portugal are great. They really are. They're a little, a little soft in the belly in terms of the up front. They sometimes fade in the last quarter. They would struggle against tier one sides for sure. But Last year against Japan in, in autumn, they, they lost by 10 points. And by the last play of the game, it was a pick. They threw an intercept. They threw they an intercept. They were going for the win. Intercept. So like, they pushed Japan right to the last play. And Japan is the team that they've kind of modeled themselves. Uh, Labushagni Labushad, uh, Labushad. is the coach. And he has cited Japan as like, how is the, what is the best example of the pathway from uh, tier two to tier one? And the answer is Japan. That's the only evidence we've seen of it. Like Italy is the other answer. Italy is technically team that has gone from tier two to tier one but we're very much of the opinion and there is a coaching argument that if you aren't really a tier one side to be honest and all evidence points to the contrary whereas yeah portugal have, have based them, themselves on being really quick they have a french coach uh, what what is Lagisque. Lagisque is, is, is his name um, and he has cited japan as the, as the benchmark for them so as such they have in their halfback marquesh and their young 10 portella two very exciting players who run run the back line very well. There's shades of France about the way their offense works in terms of how deep their back line kind of like to sit and how much they flow through tight enough channels and work their hands. And yeah, they're very exciting. They, they rarely fail to score less than 25 points in a game and they uh, yeah they make every game box office. They're, yeah, they're extraordinary, Portugal. They have flipped that competition on its head with their, with their skill. And people thought Spain were going to be the side to do that. Um, but Portugal in the last year have come on so strong and th it's the skill and speed of their players that's eye-opening some yeah. of the plays they pull off some of the aerial the aerial ability of their back three they leap and pluck balls out of the air they play the game at a different kind of pace for tier two rugby and that's true right across this competition the speed of play and the length of ball and play time has exploded in the last year 
And uh, yeah, they're absolute, they're absolute box office and a joy. Uh, offensively, they're an absolute joy. And I don't doubt, like if, if Portugal played a, a game against tier one opposition, barring maybe the very best, like the Springboks or some horrific mismatch like that, but against like a, a, an Ireland side or any, really any of the Six Nation sides, I would say they'll score points. You know, yeah. they'll probably they'll lose the game comfortably, but they'll score points. They have electrifying backs with really, really great skills. And they have been sort of the fan favourite over the last year. I've very much enjoyed watching them. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, they had a bad defeat to, to Romania on the weekend because um, they, they do fade up front and you, they can lose the collision zone. And when they lose the collision zone, it can start snowballing on them. And that, that's what happened last week. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they're really exciting to watch. And as you said, a lot of good young players coming through. Uh, you just yeah. mentioned them there, Romania. Um, it feels like Romania used to be that team, you know, where they were knocking on the door all the time and Georgia seemed to have taken their place. But obviously had the situation in 2019 with an ineligible player, so they didn't get to go to the World Cup. Where's Romania at at the minute? And in terms of like a Six Nations promotion relegation, how far do you feel they're off that kind of uh, conversation? Yeah, um, in like a couple of years ago, we were talking about um, the, decline. Uh, the decline of yeah. Romania and how they've come from this proud place of being able to potentially make World Cup quarterfinals to now not even being close to qualifying for a, a now 20 team competition. Um, but actually, one that what's what you have to give credit for their turnaround is the hiring a couple of years ago of um, Andy Robinson as coach, former English and Scottish head coach. And boy, he has done a great job. They, yeah. they, they do have a solid player base in there. They have some very good big units up front. They, they can match physically with Georgia. And now they look organized. They, they have some really good players in their back three. They can move the ball at various different tempos. They can play slow. They can play quick. They can score points. They have an organized mole. Very, like they're, they're physically up to the game against tier one sides. And they showed that last year against Argentina. And they've also, Andy Robinson has also brought in a couple of South Sea Islanders who have qualified for them as centers in uh, Tamar. Annie and Vyavasa. Yeah. And geez, and those guys are wrecking yeah. balls. And Malinti, fullback is dangerous as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, their back line is a lot better. Because even going into the, the tournament last year, they still had uh, Vlaiku, who was their most capped player ever at 10. And he, he, was, he was there at like 34 and odd at the start of the tournament. And they were a slower entity and they were still very physical, very calm yeah, for the most part. They, they have a good kind of sense of composure in the contact area because they're comfortable in the collisions but they were a little slow. And yeah, you're right, in, in through through those centres and, and now guys on the wing like Dumitru and, and Melanti at Melanti fullback, they have a whole back line that's very, very exciting. And they have two decent tens uh, now as well, young tens who are moving them about. And yeah, they're, they're, they're in pole position to go to be, to Europe in the Europe 2 spot now as a result of beating Portugal last week. They have a, a decent lead in that. And they'll, they'll, they'll set up a game against uh, Georgia for the Rugby Europe title now this, this year because of Georgia's draw to Portugal. So they're in the mix to try and win the comp for the first time since 2015, as you were saying. And uh, yeah, they're in a much healthier place than they once were. And I expect that we will see them at the World Cup. Yeah, and they had a game last year against Argentina that finished 24-17 out right. in uh, Budapest and uh, in Bucharest, I should say. And uh, that was um, it, that was as tight as they come. They were very physical. And when, when Tier 1 sides, what, what Georgia and Romania have is a capacity to level off the physical battle with the Tier 1 sides that Portugal probably don't. So that if a Tier 1 side comes and they're a little patchy and they're not quite at the pitch of the game and moving the ball as well as they might, their physicality isn't going to bail them out against against your Romanias and your Georgias because they are there for the physical battle. And with Romania getting better coached and better organised, yeah, I think they're one of the sides who who could pull off a scalp. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and there's obviously teams like Spain who are improving. Their sevens programme has been very, very successful yeah. over the last yeah. few years and they're, they're coming through. And then you mentioned teams like the Netherlands and Germany as well don't count out russia you know you think they would put quite a bit of investment into rugby they could we've heard the background on each of the nations from the italians of course from matteo and danilo we've then had uh luca covering in georgia and then we've had the guys from the overlap rugby giving us the inside of portugal romania and spain but what would each of our guests like to hear let's hear from each of them including also going to add into the conversation capo starkey kyle from his channel a scotsman do you think that most rugby fans in italy matteo would want to see promotion and relegation or do you think that a lot of them would be like it's a bit too risky with georgia and romania getting better or do you just think that italy would be good enough anyway that they'd go to the playoff 
they'd probably beat Georgia and still stay in there. I don't know because this doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, I think most people just out of spite and frustration would say yes, but if they think about it carefully, I don't think that they would like to, re to be relegated or to have the possibility. In the end, it's comfortable to be there, sure that you're not going to be kicked out anytime soon. And so, so it's a hard, com it's a really, a really hard question. What I'm trying to say when I say that I would like a promotion and relegation system is only whether there is an invest to make the second level also interesting for the fans. <laughs> Cater to us at all. We don't even know what's going on. I mean, I think it would it yeah. would still make more sense to bring that more into the conversation. And if there is a second tier, well, let's start calling it still with some dignified name or something. I don't know. Mm. In principle, I think that it won't change in the end because stakeholders own a stake mm. and <laughs> they won't like to see, to see things change. But to some extent, the movement of overall would benefit from more access to the tournament. Let's say Wales finish bottom of the Six Nations, and it's not impossible, definitely not. And uh, we play against Georgia and we lose in the playoff. They're just not going to sell out the Millennium Stadium for a game against the Netherlands. It's not going to happen, you know, and that money then that they could have generated, especially after COVID, would not be there anymore. Do you think, Danilo, that maybe these nations... It, is it on countries like Wales, like England, like Italy, like France, like Ireland, to look at the rest of Europe and try and help these teams? Or is that more down to world rugby, do you think? By the way, Brandon, uh, me and Matteo, we don't live in Italy. We live in Barcelona. Uh, <laughs> yes. we, we live both in Spain. And I'm quite uh, in, the, uh, in, the rugby, in the rugby system uh, of Catalonia and of Spain. And uh, I'm watching that issue from two perspectives, uh, as well from the Spanish one. Uh, so I think that if we're speaking about Six Nations, we're speaking about something that is not going to happen. So we're speaking about uh, a very, very theoretical problem. So it's not going to happen. What can happen it is that we take in uh, South Africa. Maybe we, we play a seven nation. Uh, maybe we play an eight nation if Japan wants to come in. I, I don't know. There are of Georgia. There are a lot of, a lot of those, of those possibilities. Or maybe a seven plus one tournament. So the the winner of the Six Nation B can come can come up and then play both tournaments. I don't know. There are different formula, but it's not going to happen that uh, Wales will be kicked out from Six Nation or Italy or Scotland or, or or even England. Or I don't think it's going to happen. If we speak about the most general problem, yes, I think that rugby is very um, elitary. Uh, sports system. Uh, so in other sports, it cannot happen, for example, that you win 27 games in a row and you never play, uh, I don't know, in football, and you never play Brazil. It can, it come a moment that you play the, the best, best one, okay? Uh, in rugby, no, it can be, I lived in Lithuania before, and I remember that Lithuania had a world record of... Uh, game one in a row that now hold i think cyprus so just because they play all the time at the same level so they don't have the the chance to to step up and i think that this thing is not a good thing for rugby so rugby should uh, try to open up uh to to, to all country by the way Portugal played the draw with Georgia a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Uh, Spain is playing. I'm living in Spain and is is growing country in rugby, uh, and that it would be nice to uh, to 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 have a a confrontation. Now, what is happening in rugby it is that the rich countries are getting more richer and richer and richer because they are getting uh, money from uh, world rugby, from Six Nations, from championships. So, and then the gap is is growing. And I don't think that that's a good thing. So in general terms, I think we have to find solutions. But in terms of what you would like to see with the Six Nations, would you be in favour of seeing promotion relegation? Would you like to keep it the same way? Would you be in favour of welcoming two teams in, kicking a side out? What would you like to see happen uh, with the Six Nations? Uh, I'm all for um, promotion relegation. I think we need like the Six Nations... Um, 
calendars and fine as it is. Although I think I could, I would personally argue and um, move it like a couple of weeks back. So um, possibly get a chance, a bit of warmer weather towards the end, but that's just, that's just my view. Um, I know like the club, the, around the club seasons, they probably wouldn't go for that, but um, I'd be all for promotion relegation where the team who finishes bottom of the uh, Six Nations play, finishes team who plays the top of the tier two and have that in the, uh, the summertime, either a two a two leg series where it's home and away either side, or it goes to a neutral venue, and then you know whoever wins that, um, you know, is the in the Six Nations the following year. It might, um, if it is, I'm, I'm guessing the likelihood it would probably be Italy and Georgia for if it if it's implemented. That is, um, like it would be Italy and Georgia for a good few years, um, and I think it could get to the point where folk would get stale of it, especially in this day and age where obviously you know with and um, social media and everything there's a lot of like everyone wanting things straight away um and things to work straight away pardon me but i think if it goes like give it time and then you know sort of we will see improvements from all the nations from tier two tier one and tier two and then it could like um expand over time but i think it's just something um if it was going to be implemented we need a bit of patience to see it working um competitively um so it's not just going to be italy and georgia you know what i mean would you be in favor of potentially just bringing two teams in maybe bringing a georgia and a romania in extending it to an eight uh, team competition or is that something that you'd rather see that there is progression for those second tier nations that there is a pathway for any side in the second tier if they can manage to get to that promotion playoff um i think i personally prefer the promotion relegation and this might be sort of the traditionalist to me because i mean i'm i like the six nations as it is like the just the, the six nations and i'm not against you know any tier two nation if they become good enough to you know get in the competition some way uh, but so um but no i think eight, eight eight nations might be um in my this is my just my personal opinion overpacking the schedule what do you think should happen with this situation do you think we should leave it as it is just keep the six nations as it is do you think there should be a promotion relegation playoff do you we say we get rid of it and we give georgia five ten years what do you think is the way to do it or is there no easy answer well there's certainly no there's certainly no easy answer and um, because you know you can you can start playing games all you want with the six nations format when the reality is that you know italy have an ownership stake in the six nations like it's 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 not going to change anytime soon they're very very resistant to, uh, to any kind of uh, promotion relegation that even comes in in the abstract. I think you have to be a little more, I think you have to be a little more practical um, when you're looking at the short-term solutions. I just don't see the Six Nations yielding on this. I think in my ideal world, absolutely promotion relegation. I just don't see a good ar or a cogent argument against it. Yeah. I don't think there's a fair reason for Italy to be in there over the other tier two sides. So absolutely, I would welcome it. But with the, in the absence of that, I just think you have to, you, what you have to do really is use the other windows. And I, I think particularly, we've talked about this before, but particularly in November, you have a great opportunity to do something different in that window. Like, it, 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 I knew you were talking about Italy being competitive in that game against the All Blacks, but it's kind of maddening from our end because it's like, it's the same game. You know, they played that game five times already this year. We yeah. don't need to see it again in November. I think you, I think we, we need to be using those windows to have teams of a similar level playing each other from all over. Get Fiji involved, get Samoa involved, get the tier two sides playing each other. I'd love to see some kind of... Uh, what happened last year, that was a good yeah. a good idea, but like more of that, you know, we were talking about the, the Autumn Nations Cup as a format for like Autumn Nations Cup has a bad name because of the way they did it, but to have like a, a competition that is like maybe three rounds and, and six divisions deep. So you can have four, teams, teams, per four teams per division. You can have tier one be All Blacks, South Africa, England, Ireland, or whatever it is at the moment, just pick that and then have an, a tier two below with, with a bunch of other tier one sides and down as far as five and six, where you'll have games like Italy v Georgia and Russia versus Chile and all of these really good games that could happen that we should be seeing more of. Um, yeah. And then a, a capacity for a team to improve such that they can promote. And then, you know, the carrot for a team like Italy or a team like Georgia would be to get from, you know, Division 4 into Division 3 and then maybe you're playing Argentina and you're playing some of these ga uh, games that are going to gonna sell more, going to be more attractive or going to expose you to better games. But it would just, it would make it a competitive window in that November series rather than some of the dead rubbers that we do that all have to have to watch in those November games, that low intensity that you can sometimes get from it. I think it would solve that. 
but also, yeah, the problem of just not enough games. Like the last, you, you mentioned that Italy have only played Georgia twice. The last time was like, was it 2017 or 2018? 2018, yeah. It was, yeah, it was 2018. I remember it was the same weekend that Ireland played the All Blacks in Chicago. And it was the week after Italy had had been pumped by Ireland, but it had a hit out. Georgia hadn't played a game since Rugby Europe last summer. And they, they scheduled that in Rome. And then they lost, Georgia lost that game. And that's like, oh, grand. That's reason enough to end this debate for the next 20 years. Like, so there we go. We have heard from all of our guests on their thoughts on their country's current situation and, of course, on what they would like to see happen with the Six Nations. Make sure, as always, to check out all the work that they're doing. All their links will be in the description down below. They cover a vast amount of, of rugby uh, from their grassroots level all the way up to their national sides and everything in between. What would I like to see happen? I would love to see promotion and relegation. I'd love to see a system where there was a playoff with a team in the second tier, the European Rugby uh, Championship, will play against the bottom team in the Six Nations over two legs, one in the Six Nations country and then one in the champions of the European Rugby Championships country. Most likely, as said throughout the video, it would be Italy and Georgia facing one another for the next few years. But as we've heard from the all of our guests, the likes of Portugal, Spain, Romania are certainly improving and will be challenging there over the next few years. The big issue for us, of course, is that the unions need to sign up for it. each of them own a ownership stake within the Six Nations with CBC getting involved and getting that seventh stake in there. I'm not too sure if I can see this happening, but I do think that something needs to change to enable these tier two nations to have opportunities to be competitive at the top level and we need to see progression for these countries as well but that's just my opinion i'd be really keen to hear your thoughts as always let me know your thoughts in the comments down below i'll make sure to try and reply to every single comment if i can leave a like on the video hit that subscribe button it's a busy week on the channel we've got six nations round three coming up on the weekend we'll have previews in the build-up to that as well i'm so excited for it thank you very much for watching stay safe folks it's still pretty windy out there and i will catch you soon here on bs rugby Peace.